Ah, I wanted to wake you up. Guess what? We mixed it up on you. You only got 10 minutes of music worship up front. Some of you are like, wait a second. I was going to zone out and like rest in my brain and try to wake up to God for another 10 minutes. No, we're doing it different today. So we're jumping right into Isaiah 53 because you got to do a little bit different right before Thanksgiving. You realize three more days from now, you prepare to eat and sleep and eat and sleep and sleep and eat and eat and sleep and maybe do a little bit of homework. All right. How many of you still have this? In September, uh, we gave you a symbol. We gave you a reminder. We gave you something that would hopefully stir in you what it, um, what it means to know that you need to be saved. And uh, this is the last university passage for fall semester uh, where we're in Isaiah 53. And if somehow you missed the other two, don't worry, we're going to wrap up the whole series today. And if you were in the last two, I think we're going to cover something really important. But this continues to be in my pocket or in my car or on my desk. And it's been a great reminder for me that I need to be saved. Here's some of the things that we've done in September we kind of really made something very specific. We acknowledged that we are sinners. We talked about the human condition. It's the whole reason for the artwork that we've done, that uh, the, the, the sign of that kind of thorns and everything else that either individually or as an entire planet of human beings, uh, sin wants to create havoc and create a train wreck. In October, we focused in on the fact that not only are we sinners, uh, but we are saved by sacrifice. And I had a bunch of you tell me afterwards that you really appreciated the different kind of phraseology of that because you often hear in church, if you've grown up in church or if you're new in church or trying to figure out this phase, you often hear, we are sinners saved by grace. But I've been saying in this Isaiah 53 series, we are sinners saved by sacrifice that makes grace possible. Uh, Part of what Isaiah 53 has done for us has reminded us, unless Christ laid down his life for our sins, unless there was atonement at oneness with God, if a right relationship, something had to happen to cover up all the intentional known sins that I have, but also all the unintentional, I don't even realize I'm sinning. And so you got to help me out a little bit just to make sure everybody gets what we did in September and what we did in October. This is going to be a join in, say it with me moment. West Campus, Pastor Tatiana's in the front row. She's going to make sure you do it too. So we're going to put this full screen slide. Say these three phrases with me, okay? Are you ready? West Campus and East, here we go. We are sinners saved by sacrifice, which makes grace possible. Perfect. We can jump into the final university passage. We have talked a lot about why we need to be saved. We've talked a lot about how we're going to be saved, all the different sacrifice understanding the Old Testament. And now we're going to talk about who. We're going to talk about the Savior. I don't know if any of you watched the news this week or saw something come up on whatever, whatever apps you're on or anything else, but how many of you heard that uh, Stan Lee died uh, this week at 95 years old? Uh, are there any Marvel fans in the room? Okay, come on. All the DC fans will fight you later um, because that's what superheroes do. They fight, right? Um, I want you to think about it for a second. Put up a a picture of some of the Marvel uh, characters uh, so you can think for a second who are your favorites. Uh, You have Black Panther, Spider-Man, Iron Man, you know, you have, oh, you got a couple of cheers there. Uh, You have Gamora. But the best of all time is Rocket the Raccoon. I mean, uh, how can you not love a raccoon? Uh, I I want us to think about superheroes uh, a little bit today uh, because they're interesting. Um, I read an article recently out of uh, Relevant Magazine that talked about our infatuation with superheroes. Um, Every single one of us have spent a lot of money on movies or comic books or other things. And there's something interesting about superheroes. And what's interesting about them is we like it that they have the potential to save But it's interesting, we also kind of like that they get to be raw and human like us. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, We we love someone that can have a short temper but still save the world, you know, because then it gives us permission to just go hulk on our roommate and go, but, you know, other people have 
temper problems. Sometimes we wish, you know, wouldn't it be great to be uh, sarcastic, cynical, filthy rich, and occasionally save the world, Iron Man, right? Or uh, you think about every single one of the superheroes, there's an emphasis on their human flaws and everything else. And so part of what I was thinking for this final series, I told you we've already talked about why we need to be saved, how we're going to be saved, but who will save us? That part of me has been thinking lately, if you and I had the opportunity to build a hero, what would that hero look like? What type of hero would we need to save us or save our world and all that's going on right now? How, how would we build a hero? Uh, I want you to imagine for a second what characteristics, what attributes, if you were the one in charge of writing a narrative, a script, a storyline, who would you choose to be a superhero? Would you let all their flaws in? Would you let their short temper, their sarcasm, their spoiled richness in there? Um, and so here's what we did. We wanted you not only to think about that and engage that, but we actually asked some of your peers to help us do that. We've got about five different groups, 26 some students. And what we did is we stuck this poster in front of them with about 15 different attributes, characteristics, and we put them on the spot to build the perfect superhero, savior, messiah. I want you to see a short uh, video that Jeff Spencer put together that will help you see what they came up with. And I'm so curious what you might have come up with. Check it out. What I want to do right away before we uh, critique it or pull some insight from it is I want you to hear... One and a half verses out of Isaiah 53 that we have not looked at this semester yet. Listen to Isaiah 53, 2b and 3. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others. A man of suffering and antiquated with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Isaiah 53. It's interesting. Those were not paid actors, I promise, right? There's some see, uh, cheesy uh, Chevy commercial where they say, these are real people. They were real people. They weren't paid. Uh, there were some interesting things that came up when they did it. Uh, we have a slide of what the stickers were, and I, I actually brought uh, this sheet with me because it's so intriguing to think about everything that's happened here. You can kind of look at the screen for a second. Those that are on west, those that are on east, and see what was chosen and what wasn't. Here's some interesting insights if uh, you will think out loud with me for a second. What isn't chosen as you look at that right now? And I'm kind of curious if you would have done it, would you have chosen them? But here's three highlights I would love to throw up there. Frail, weak, and defenseless never got chosen. Why wouldn't that be a great hero? Uh, look at these others too. Um, those are kind of on the weak side. Uh, it's obvious nobody in um, AP right now wants a cocky, dominant jerk hero or savior, and I guess we're done with rich heroes. And then the two that were chosen that I was kind of surprised about was one person got brave and chose irrelevant, and somebody else, four people, chose humble. Uh, to give you a little bit of preview for spring, I want you to know that we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 2. We're going to move to the New Testament for our university passage. And a big theme in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, as it describes Christ, is humility is a huge part of what it means for who Jesus is to save the world. Uh, this whole thing was so interesting to me because of what wasn't chosen, yet what we read in this passage. And what I want to do with you this morning a little bit is to kind of look at each one of those and talk a little bit about them. Listen to again, um, Isaiah 53, 2b. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. I, I don't know what the deal was, but... People didn't want frail, weak, defenseless. One person was brave and hit ugly. <laughs> what do we do with that? Why did God choose to use the most unlikely Savior? 
the most unlikely savior that you and I would overlook. Why did God choose that that was the plan? If you haven't been in the first two university passages, hopefully you'll remember this is an Old Testament passage, which means this is a prophetic voice that's saying somewhere in the future, God is going to provide a savior, a Messiah. And I almost don't want to use the word superhero or hero because we're so congested in our own minds of what we think that is. But this is one set apart, different than anybody else. And God chose to use the lowly things, the things that are overlooked. I don't know if any of you feel displaced right now or um, wrestling with some of the complexities of Thanksgiving, but uh, here's a 15-year tradition, so I'm not talking about anybody in this room. I'm talking about what I've experienced uh, over my 15 years in a college setting on a university campus. Every time we move into Thanksgiving, I start to hear often um, family conversations, Uh, Many of you have great families, amazing settings. You can't wait to get home, but that is not the narrative or the story for everybody. As we think about one who had no majesty, who got overlooked, who probably felt like as Christ was living out ministry in Jerusalem and Bethlehem and all throughout Nazareth, do you realize those of us that coming into this next week, if we're like, I'd rather just stay in my apartment rather than go home to chaotic home Uh, you have a savior that knows what that's like to be overlooked. If you have family members that won't notice if you're there or not there, you have a savior that knows what that feels like. From the very beginning of the birth of Jesus, the first thing Mary and Joseph had to do, it tells us, was escape because people were out to kill the Messiah as a baby. And they went to Egypt. Can you imagine your family members talking about being dislocated and moved away from home and living in a foreign land with foreign food and trying to find work and trying to live? We have a Savior that knows what it's like to be displaced, overlooked, not paid attention to. And as I think about what it means to have a Savior, a Messiah, this Isaiah passage really makes me wrestle with who was Jesus and what does that mean for us? This is the second verse. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. In Matthew chapter 8, when Jesus was talking to the disciples, one of the things that he highlighted for them is in order to be a part of this uh, God following, Jesus following discipleship, know that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You want to talk about being a savior. What about a rejected savior? And it's interesting, if you remember what we read in Isaiah 53 in verse 1, it says, the arm of the Lord has produced a solution. God has provided something for us. And basically what the rest of Isaiah 53 hints at, and so does Isaiah 52, is that basically the Israelites and potentially us out in the future Uh, kind of rejected it because we don't like it and we're not sure if that's the brand we want. Come on, why can't Jesus be just a whoop up, take charge, get rid of all the brokenness and everything and just fix it like that fast with a big bolt of lightning? Why can't can't Jesus walk into this planet and the whole world just bows down and knows why this flip the table upside down most unlikely savior. I think Jesus knew that we had to get to a place where we would receive and accept rather than be forced or demanded. The hardest thing though as a human, if you're like me, is I'm always looking for the wrong kind of savior. I only check into Jesus when I want a quick solution or uh, comfort rather than live through something difficult in an intentional way. When I think about a rejected savior, one who out of our disbelief don't want anything to do with him, I think about other stories. Um, This particular person gave me permission to share this story a long time ago. I think I've only shared it one other time at APU. But this savior that we can actually look at and understand knows many of the pains and the brokenness and the uh, spaces that we've been in made all the difference one day when I was sitting in a church office Um, in Roland Heights, and a knock came on the door at like six in the morning. 
I was at work early. It was when I was working at a local church, and I opened the door, and before me was a guy about my age. At the time, I was 23 years old, and, and he goes, I know you're probably not open, but I was driving by the church, and I saw the light on, and, and I'm like, okay. And he says, can I come in and talk? You're a pastor, right? I'm like, well, it depends on, like, what do you want to tell me? Uh, but, but, but I said, yes, I am a pastor, and he came in, and he sat in a chair, and I sat across from him. And have any of you ever seen anybody weep uncontrollably like there is pain in their chest and they're just like convulsing and crying and can't even get a hold of themselves? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you have felt that and been there at some point in your life. Some of you haven't yet, but you've seen it in others. And what this young man began to tell me was that he was that morning headed to the local uh, state courthouse for a trial uh, where he was uh, basically on trial for manslaughter. He had had what he described as an everyday average normal evening out, probably had too much to drink, thought he had it, and drove home and basically was not able to drive well, crossed the middle line and killed a, a 28-year-old teacher uh, headed home that night. And he just sobbed uncontrollably in front of me that he said, all I can do is see her face, see the newspaper articles, and know that I've robbed a family of somebody. This Isaiah 53, a rejected Savior, an unlikely Savior, I got to sit across from that person and had no idea how to talk about it, but tried to describe a Savior that knew what it was like to have the whole world against him. Talk about a savior that knows what it's like to come and save humanity, what it's like to have a God who says, there is so much brokenness, I can do something new in you. This passage for Isaiah, for me, I don't want some hero that's rich, sarcastic, and occasionally saves the world. I don't want some superhero that, that just has a, a short temper and, and it gets angry really fast, but sometimes saves the world. I want a savior that's been rejected, that's unlikely, that knows what it's like to sit in the midst of some of the biggest brokenness and sadness, to weep deep from within. One of my favorite things in the New Testament is to see that Jesus wept, that Jesus knew sorrow, that Jesus lived in the midst of what every one of us is going through. Listen to this last verse one more time that we had read before. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. The fires uh, the, this last week um, are hard for me because it reminds me of when I lived in San Diego and I was a pastor. Uh, when I was there in, I think it was 2003, they had the Cedar Fires where over 2,000 homes were burned and eight people were actually uh, killed by fires during that time. And it was one of those weird things where the, uh, the, the leaders of the church said, hey, we'd love to sponsor you. Why don't you go get trained by the Red Cross? You'll probably never use it. Who knows what happens? And a month later, there's smoke and fires all over San Diego. And I get a phone call from the Red Cross. And they say, we need you now. Please grab your badge and your jacket and show up. I show up to this home and there's a, a Red Cross a person. It's not a chaplain, it's just an everyday worker. And he says, I don't know what to tell you to do, but in that house right there, three families lost their homes. They're all related to each other and three of their family members were killed by fires. Good luck. And he walked to the street, got in his car and drove away. I walked into the home and the amount of sorrow and heaviness, the only thing I could do was sit and listen and pray internally. Half the crowd wanted nothing to do with God and were angry that I was there. The other half were begging for God's mercy and God's intervention and God's hope in the midst of overwhelming tra uh, tragedy. And I thought about this as I was preparing for this sermon that we have a relevant savior who knows what it's like to live in this pain. I don't know what type of superhero you would build. I don't know if you would say strong, dominant, ready to kick butt, but, but we have a savior who's been snubbed, who's been overlooked, who has experienced sorrow, who has been overwhelmed with pain. And Isaiah 53 prophesizes about Jesus who would come one day and save all of us from our sins. 
Not from some far off distant place of a wealthy king, but right in the midst of us without sin, without anger, without all those things that would, we would probably go, well, I like you as a savior sometimes, but you're kind of scary the rest of the time. That if you are someone who has begun to get to a point where you're like, ah, Jesus isn't relevant. Jesus doesn't know me. Jesus hasn't experienced the things I'm experiencing I think if you read this passage and you open your hearts for what God would want to do in you, you might realize the only one true Savior again and again is Jesus. In Isaiah 53, do you know who a lot of the Israelites would have chosen? If they had to build a superhero, they might have chosen Nebuchadnezzar. Have you ever seen the Hanging Gardens and that amazing Babylon next to the Euphrates River when people would draw it or try to imagine what it was like? It probably would have been like a giant Hilton Hotel with hanging plants everywhere. And you can imagine Nebuchadnezzar up there with that just big old kingly-like beard. And I'm wondering if Nebuchadnezzar might have been like the superheroes today that we love to watch and think about. And is that the Savior that Israel needed? What about in the New Testament when the Jews that were being taken over by the Romans are like, we need a ride in on a war horse savior to destroy all of Rome and finally put us back on top again. But God instead chose to give us the lamb of God, the one who would save us from our sins and the one that would actually know what it's like to live on this planet and wrestle through going home being tough, making decisions that are life-changing forever, to be in the spots where all of a sudden we have no idea what to hold on to for hope. Our God produced his son to be all of that for us. Here's what I love to do at APU, because you never know. If you have never received the one who died for sinners, the one who was sacrificed the one who made grace and forgiveness possible, you know that the best Thanksgiving gift you could ever have is finally say, forget all the superheroes are flawed. I'm ready for a true savior and a true Messiah. If some of you have gotten really distracted over these couple months and you really thought, man, my freshman year, my sophomore year, my junior, senior of college, it's gonna be really significantly tied into God and all you've been tied into is a bunch of other idols or a bunch of other ideas of a superhero. This is a great opportunity to again go, there is no life but life in you, God. If you'd been on that line and you got to decide where to put the stickers, I'm wondering if frail, defenseless, weak, ugly, would have been anywhere in your list of choices. And if it was, why would that make the difference? I think you and I have to wrestle with what we hear in Scripture and what we understand as our Savior. Some of you have seen different movies uh, uh, that have been about the life of Jesus. And there was one recently that was put out by a Hollywood producer. And uh, the person they chose for Jesus started getting hashtag hot Jesus. Um, LAUGHTER Uh, Some of you will remember if you walk into a church that hasn't got any new paintings or anything lately, we'll have some 1970s like feathered hair and blue eyes, Jesus. Uh, Isaiah 53 challenges everything we would imagine or want. You have an unlikely savior that's been overlooked. You have a rejected savior that is out of our rejection and disbelief. You have a relevant savior who knows what it's like to be snubbed and in pain. That's the savior I want. I want to give you a small bit of good news here and something you might be able to uh, jump on or live out. I mentioned the fires and I didn't do that lightly because it's a really painful, sad space for me. But when I was there, at the end of the time, what they really wanted was Jesus. They let me pray over them at the end and was able to be able to support an encouragement of how God can work in the midst of grief. Many of you have asked us, what could I do? There's fires now, I wanna do something. And what I love is in our CSA office, there have been some students who have reached out to fire departments, reached out to communities where families have lost their homes. And the CSA office for the next three days actually has a letter station where what many of the firefighters and other people have said it could be so encouraging is notes from people around California. If sometime today you'd like to be a part of that, you just need to go to the CSA office and you could write a letter 
to just bless somebody, to pray for them and encourage them. But I want to end with this, and it won't just be this. We're actually going to have worship here at the end, uh, both on West Campus and on East Campus. Uh, they're actually going to car- start coming up here because we never get to do music worship at the end of a chapel. But this chapel felt like it was so important to talk about what it means to have a true Savior that is relevant, that has been through pain. And what we want to do today is I want you to hear this great story out of Acts chapter 8. If any of you have time during Thanksgiving, read Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. And it's about Philip being open to what God wanted him to do. And he ended up meeting an Ethiopian eunuch. And do you know what Philip read to this Ethiopian? He read to him Isaiah 53. And the Ethiopian that knew nothing about God or the traditions or kind of like what it would mean to have Jesus because Jesus had not been explained, basically got excited about a relevant, unlikely, broken, sacrificed Savior that could save the world from sin. Here's what I'd love to ask you to do. On West and East, I want you to spend the next 10 minutes just singing, thinking about this, And if for the first time ever you want to invite this Savior to really save you, today's a great day. And if you're someone who has kind of ignored this true Savior, this one and only Messiah, today's a great day to re-engage this Messiah. So on East and West, if you'll stand, I'm going to pray over you. I guess you're you're so like thrown off. You're like, we never sing at the end. Stop doing this. Uh, On West and East, West, if you'll stand. I'm going to pray, and you guys have 10 minutes to sit in this while you sing. Lord, I need you. I need a Savior, and I need an unlikely Savior. You know our pain. You know where we're at. You know what we need. I pray this morning that no one will leave here without experiencing you. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. You are dismissed.